So we're going to start out with a very simple uh, model of the economy. So we'll start with the supposition. Suppose the economy consists of three sectors. And the three sectors will be service, electricity, and oil production. Now, obviously, there's more parts of the economy than just these, but this is just considering a simple case. There's probably, I don't know. 30 industries or more, so that would be way too complicated. I don't think we want a 30 by 30 matrix, so we'll just stick to three. It's a good number. Two's a little boring, three's just right. Uh, that's true in a lot of things in math. Uh, so we're gonna suppose each sector, each sector produces one type of good, uh, and each sector purchases goods from itself uh, and the two other sectors. So for example, if we think about uh, the electrical industry, yes, they generate electricity, but sometimes they need uh, services to come through and maintain different machines uh, or things to be cleaned. Uh, they very likely are going to buy oil to produce electricity. I know there's other ways to produce it too, but we're just gonna keep it really simple for this example. So uh, the electricity industry is going to use some services and some oil to produce their electricity. And likewise, in the service industry, we're in the service industry right now, and there's lights on, electricity. You probably drove here, or skateboarded here, one of the two, but if you drove here, you used some oil, or took your motorcycle, you used a little less oil. So either industry you're in, you're gonna be using, consuming things from that industry and other ones too. So we just have a really simple model here. So I'll write that supposition down, and of course, this half dollar sign means suppose, so I'm going to use that. So we're going to suppose each sector uh, produces one type of good. And purchases or consumes uh, goods from itself or the other two sectors and or. So this is called a closed system. So what a closed system means, there's no other inputs or outputs that are not represented by these three sectors. So obviously there's more sectors. Let's see another one. Timber, that's a big one around here. There's probably a lot, lot of things around here made of wood. And so uh, timber production would be another sector that obviously would use oil quite a bit, and some electricity, um, and some service themselves because they need to maintain their machines and all that. Uh, but in this system, we're going to pretend like there is no uh, timber industry. So all the oil that's being produced is going to go into these three industries right here, not any of the other ones. So that's what we mean by closed system. And there's no other inputs. Obviously, food's kind of important. So there's no agriculture in this system right here. So I think most everybody eats food. So that's not represented at all right here. Um, and of course, food needs all these three things to be created. Uh, at least now it does. And so this is a closed system because we're not going to consider any of those other aspects. So everything, all the oil produced is going to go through these three, all the electricity produces in these, and all the services produced are consumed in these three industries. So that's what we mean by the word closed system. So there's no other inputs or outputs. So when all outputs 
are consumed by the system. And there are no other inputs. So now we're going to make a uh, production and consumption chart. So we need a four by four grid. So we're going to have production on the horizontal. So this is produced by, and then on the vertical will be consumption consumed by. So I'll fill this in in another color. Let's go purple. So we got service electricity, oil, and then service, electricity and oil. So our numbers will be one fourth, uh, this is going down to the first column, one fourth, one half. Electricity is going to be one third, one third, one third. The only time I write fractions with this sort of diagonal divider is when I run out of vertical space. So I recommend never write fractions the way I'm writing it, unless you are kind of forced to. So oil is one half, one fourth, one fourth. So we'll look at one of these numbers. Let's look at the uh, one half right here. So that one half. That represents the oil industry consumes one half of services output. So the way this chart's read in the consumption, so we're in the consumption row and the oil will be consuming one half of what's produced by the service industry. So that's how you read the chart. Uh, let's see. The other number, the other one half up there, is how much the service industry consumes of the production of oil. So I'm going to let x equaling the vector x s, x e, and x o. Uh, these are going to be the outputs of each industry. So what we want to do is have an equilibrium so that our system is producing basically exactly what's going to be consumed by the other industries. So we don't just produce uh, twice as much oil as it would be consumed because that would be kind of silly. Uh, it's not an economics class. I'm sure it have other consequences, but we just want the most efficient system without being wasteful. So in equilibrium, Each sector uh, spends its entire revenue on its consumption. So 
So what that means, we're going to write some linear equations. So here XS is going to be the output of the service industry. So the output of the service industry is going to be one-fourth XS, meaning it consumes a fourth of its own production, plus one-third XE. So the service industry is going to consume one-third of the electricity uh, plus one-half of the oil. So it's one-half XO. I thought that these are the, the outputs. So is it? So it is the output, but we don't know the numerical output. So maybe it's a hundred, maybe it's a thousand. So we don't actually know XS, but if I, let's say, let's make it easy and say if XS, if I produced a hundred units, yeah. then uh, I would be produce, I would be consuming a quarter, which would be 25 of my own service units, plus one third of whatever XE is, plus one half of XO. So I guess my question is how come uh, you don't go down since it's an output, like services outputting one fourth to itself, and then another one fourth to electric, and then one half to oil. Uh, so you could set it up with the other perspective, which uh, you'd be basically using columns instead of rows. Okay. Uh, so we're setting this up thinking about um, spending revenue, but you could instead look at uh, this is basically expenditure. You could look instead at um, basically think about it what you're trading away is what you produce and then you're trading it for what you're consuming right here so that's what we mean but like okay. equal just means it's, it's the same thing So now we're going to go for the XE. So XE, that's one fourth XS plus one third XE plus one fourth XO. And then last up, our XO is one half XS. Plus one third XE plus one fourth XO. So the idea is we don't know these three values. I just put that blob around, but we know how it's related to the other quantities. So what we're going to be doing is finding that those values. So we can do some easy algebra. I'm just going to solve for zero by subtracting. And the first one XS to the other side, and the second one will subtract XE to the other side, and the third one will subtract XO to the other side. So I'm going to be solving for zero to make these equations in a form that we're used to. So we're about to turn into a homogeneous system. So these are the same as zero equals negative three fourths XS plus one third XE plus one half XO. Our second equation, we're subtracting one XE. So we have one fourth XS minus two thirds XE plus one fourth XO. And the third, we'll get one half XS. plus one-third XE minus three-fourths XO. All right, find XS, XE, and XO. You just have a homogeneous linear system. So all you need to do is put in a matrix, rub, reduce, solve. You should have one free variable.
Uh oh, something's going wrong with my arithmetic. That ah oh, yes. Uh oh. So I give me zero, negative twenty four plus four is negative twenty. All right, so that will change. Probably enough to just start over after that. So we just go plus row three now, and that should cancel our first to zero. And at the same time, well, I'll do it in two separate steps. So I multiply the last row by one fifth. Last thing I'll do is plus two row three. Clean that second row up a little bit. So I got three, zero, negative three, zero, four, negative three, and multiply by one third. One fourth. All right, so we got x, and the order is super important because we're not going x zero, one, and two, or we're not doing numerical order. So it's x s, x e, x p. Hopefully that's right. S e. Oh no. Oh, I have p for petroleum. It's x o for oil. All right, so XO is free. So we'll let XO equal T, XS minus XO equals zero, XS equals XO, which is T. And last up, XO minus three fourths X, ooh, XE minus three fourths XO equals zero. So XE equals three fourths X O, which is three fourths T. So writing all these together, so we got a T, three fourths T, and T. So factor the t out, we got one, three fourths, one. How would I turn this into nicer values that are integers? Multiply by four, that's all I have to do. So that's t times one fourth, four, three, four. All right, so we'll use our four, three, four right here. So I'm gonna choose t equals four, which will give us x equals four, three, four. So that'll be our ratio right there. So production's kind of similar, but we need, according to this, we need a little less electricity than we need service and oil. So that's, that's what it tells you right here. It's basically how much of each section, sector do we need to optimize the economy. So if everybody wants to go produce oil, there's going to be some problems. It'll be very inefficient.
because there'll be a huge need for electricity and services that won't be provided. So this will be the, uh, the way to equally distribute it, or optimally distribute it, not equal. All right, so this is optimum ratio for uh, equal, uh, what do we call that, for equilibrium. So let's uh, write out, so we're going to go back and rewrite the equation. So I'm going to call our original way, way back. So I'm going to come back here for one minute and I'll use uh, this purple marker. So I'm going to call this matrix E. I'm going to grab the coefficients from above. So these coefficients before I subtract. So I'm just going to grab those three coefficients or those nine coefficients and put them into the E matrix. So we got one fourth, one third, one half, one fourth, one third, one fourth, one half, one third, one fourth. So that's our E matrix. So we'll be using that matrix. And all I'm gonna do is rewrite that entire linear system with this E matrix and the variable X. So if we look right here, what I have in the box, if I write it, it's x equals ex. So I got just the x on the left, and on the right, it's e times the x vector. That's how we get that linear system right there. x equals ex. So if we want this to be an equilibrium, is there such an x that makes this true? So this is set up very similar to our, uh, I think there's a last problem we did from class on Thursday. It's very similar set up to that one where we were dealing with toothpaste and we wanted to know after basically an infinite number of months, what would things settle down to be? So what would produce no more changing? This is situation is a little different, but we're still looking for equilibrium. We want to know what vector X would satisfy this equation. And of course we can subtract x over, so we got zero equals e x minus x. Now I'm going to factor out x. And remember, multiplication is not commutative, so I gotta factor x on the right side. I can't factor it out on the left side, so that's super important. So how do I fix, what I wrote down doesn't make sense, how do I fix it? Identity, there we go. So there's invisible identity, so you get E minus I. All right, so this would be the same thing as the null space of E minus I. So we'll compute E minus I right now. So we got E minus I, so our E matrix was one fourth, one third, one half, one fourth, one third, one fourth, one half, one third, one fourth. All right, do the columns make probability vectors? Yes. So they're all positive, and if we add them up, we get one for each column. So that's what it takes to be a probability vector. What do we call a matrix whose columns are probability vectors? 
stochastic. Stochastic? I think it's stochastic. Yeah. yeah. So we have a stochastic matrix here. Oh, I did not actually subtract the identity yet. Better do that. So our first row minus three fourths, one third, one half, one fourth negative two-thirds, one-fourth, and one-half, one-third, negative three-fourths. This matrix should look familiar because it's the exact matrix we started with. So here's a different way to get this matrix. It's basically the same way, just you do it in linear equations versus doing it as a uh, linear algebra uh, equation, a single linear algebra equation versus a system of regular algebraic equations. All right, so that is uh, linear economic models. So all you have to do is know how the system is uh, basically your original coefficient matrix and then you know how to set up equilibrium. The only difference between what is the difference between this and eigenvalues and eigenvectors? Super similar. What's the only real difference here? Instead of minus one, that's minus lambda. Yep. All you do is drop a lambda in there. So here, basically, we're trying to find uh, if there is a eigenvalue of one. And then what's the eigenspace? That's another way to think about what we're doing right here. Uh, whereas I, when you bring in eigenvalues, they don't have to be one anymore. Sometimes they're zero, negatives, positives, all that good stuff. And I think your homework, you had a couple complex ones. I was checking them out. So you had some fun with those, hopefully. So I'll keep your uh, quizzes and your final exam real. So you had some questions, and I think there were some ZP, a few ZP problems maybe back in the day. Uh, maybe we just did them in class, I don't know. but. I will make sure your numbers are real on your uh, midterms and quizzes. But as you found out in your homework, everything works the exact same, as long as you pay attention and you're careful. Nothing special is going on. So now we're going to get into diagonalization. So I'll change your homeworks around so you have time for your di diagonalization homework. They're guessing diagonalization. I'm really bad at spelling, and now you're seeing how bad I am. Diagonalization. I think that's good. Okay. So we'll start with the definition. So this will be definition of uh, similar. So we'll have two matrices A and B. They need to be square matrices. Uh, they can be over any field. Ours will be the real numbers. Uh, so A is similar to B. Uh, the way we write A is similar to B, we use a squiggle. So it's a single squiggle. I think it's on the keyboard to the left of the one key somewhere up there. But 
It's not the best squiggle. I can do better. There we go. It's a little better. A squiggle B. Uh, if there is an invertible matrix, P, and it needs to be an n by n matrix. Such that P inverse A P is equal to B. Now that might seem sort of random and arbitrary. But there's an invertible matrix such that P inverse A P equals B. So that's our definition. Let's do a tiny bit of algebra. So the first thing we're gonna check uh, is that similarity is an equivalence relation. So equivalence relation, has anybody heard that before? All right, so we're gonna see what that means. There's three pieces to it. The first part, things need to be self-similar. So A is similar to itself. So that's, uh, I forget the right names of these properties. It's probably something like the identity property, but that's self-similar. Uh, if A is similar to B, that happens exactly when so if and only if B is similar to A, so that's what we call a symmetric property. So if A is similar to B, then B is similar to A. And the third property is the transitive property. A is similar to B and B is similar to C. What would that imply? A is similar to C. A is similar to C. So we're gonna prove all these. First one I think is called symmetric or reflexive, one of the two. All right, so we're gonna prove our similarity is an equivalence relation. So, well, first of all, before we get into this, equals is an equivalence relation. So, a number equals itself. That's pretty obvious. Uh, if a, a number A equals a number B, then, of course, the number B equals the number A. It's a little bit silly with equals, but the last one, if A equals B and B equals C, then A equals C. So, it satisfied the last one. Now, Inequalities, like less than or equal to, is not an equivalence relation. Which rule does it break? Is A less than or equal to A? Mm -hmm. Yep. Let's look at property three. A less than or equal to B and B less than or equal to C. Can I say that A is less than or equal to C? Mm -hmm. Yes. Yep. What about property two? Can't flip it around. Inequality sign is not symmetric. You can't turn it around. It means something, it means mostly the opposite if you turn it around. So inequality is not an equivalence relation. It's an inequivalence. So it would satisfy one and three, but not two. Uh, so that was just a couple of comparisons that we've seen just to relate them back. Things are more familiar. But now we're gonna prove Similarity is equivalence relation. So let's go for number one first. All right, what matrix P would I use here? So I need to show that A, A, P, how do I write that? P inverse A, P equals A. What matrix P would I use? Identity. Identity. P is the identity matrix. 
And clearly multiply by the identity. What's the inverse of the identity matrix? The identity. the identity matrix. Like the reciprocal of one is one. So let P equal the identity matrix. And then you got I inverse A, I clearly equals A. All right, so number one is pretty easy to prove. Now I'm gonna go for number two. So let's suppose, and let's not write the whole word out, save some virtual ink. Suppose A similar to B, we wanna show B is similar to A. All right, so if A is similar to B, that means P inverse, there is such a P, and there is There is a matrix P such that P inverse AP equals B. So what I want to do is some algebra to get down to, I'll use the letter Q, Q inverse A, nope, Q inverse B, Q is equal to A. So I want a matrix that would show that B is similar to A. So it would look like some matrix inverse times B times the matrix equals A. How in the world can I get this? So let's think about where we start and where we want to end up. I'm going to find Q. Unfortunately, I can't just solve for Q because it doesn't even exist yet. What can I solve for instead? Let's try to solve for A because what I'm trying to show, A is all by itself right there. So if I can get A by itself and make it look like uh, B multiplied on either side by some matrix, maybe that'll work. Anybody want to take a guess at what Q is going to be? P inverse. P inverse. All right, that's a good guess. So let's go ahead, solve for A. What's the first move to solve for A? Multiply on the left by P. So we're going to multiply on the left by P. And what's the other move we're going to have to do? on the right by P inverse. So you have to make sure you multiply on the correct side, the correct matrix. So if I multiply on the left by P inverse, that's not gonna cancel out. I'm gonna multiply on the left by regular P. So the way I am going to write this, I'm gonna do both at the same time because I am crazy. So I'm going to multiply on the left by P and the right by P inverse. So I'm doing both at the same time. It's really important that you keep them on the correct side because they, they make a big difference. And then of course I can change sides, so I'm just going to take the mirror image of this equation. So I'm getting closer to my destination up there on the right, and then all I have to do, that first matrix is Q inverse. And then the second matrix is Q. So let Q equal P inverse. Then if we invert both of them, Q inverse equals P inverse inverse, which is just P. And we have that Q that we were looking for. So we just showed that this is symmetric. You can reverse the order, still are similar. All right, third step, we're gonna suppose that A similar B and B similar C, and we want to show that A similar to C. All right, so I'm going to, underneath A similar to C, let's use the matrix name, I'm gonna use matrix R here. So what I'm trying to show is there exists a matrix R such that R inverse, yeah, first R inverse A R equals C. So I have to put this inside of a cloud because it's our, it's our goal to get there. Eventually, hopefully we'll get there, but we can't assume it. We're trying to show that's true. So now I'm gonna write down what we know. So I know that A is similar to B, so there exists a matrix P 
such that P inverse A P equals B. There's also a matrix for the other similarity. So B is similar to C. It doesn't have to be the same matrix P. So it could be a different matrix, I'll call it Q. So there's a P such that that, and there exists a matrix Q such that Q inverse B Q equals C. All right, I want you to use algebra and figure out how the matrix R relates to P and Q. So I'll give you two minutes to do this. And here is a great starting place. Look at P inverse AP equals B and sub it in. That's all you really need to do. So what should R equal? R should equal P times Q or PQ. All right, let's fix the last part right here. What I have circled should look like one thing to the negative first power, not two inverse matrices multiplied together. So how do I fix that? There's a special rule I have to pay attention to. So when I do inverses, I also switch the order of multiplication. So when you apply an inverse, you actually change the order of multiplication. And then we reassociate like this, it should be really clear that PQ is our R matrix that we were looking for, like this. Oh. Time to go. All right. Time flies when you're multiplying matrices. 